Hi, welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, an historic moment in the state of Pennsylvania. Guess what? The state of Pennsylvania takes over the city of Harrisburg. And then an important health care update, Pennsylvania politics and government, in depth and in detail. And guess what? It all starts right now. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Hi, welcome back to the program. Well, what a week it has been in the capital city of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, with the state passing legislation that literally would have it take over the operation of some functions of the government of the city of Harrisburg. We have two of the state's leading reporters are going to weigh in on this and a couple of other subjects. Uh, Tony Romeo with KYW and KDK Radio and John Meisick with the Allentown Morning Call. Veteran reporters all. You like that? Veteran reporters all. I like that. All right, Tony, I want to start with you. Look, this Harrisburg takeover thing is a pretty big deal. I mean, this has been in the offing for months. Uh, give us some of the outlines of what, of what occurred this week. Well, the bigger deal, is, of course, is the bankruptcy uh, that the city council has been flirting with for some time and actually pulled the trigger on uh, earlier this month. And, uh, you know, in a parallel track, we've had the legislature moving to enact this takeover legislation because of the concerns that, that the, of, a, of a move like that. So the governor has actually now signed the bill that was passed by the House Take and Senate. Takeover. They would essentially create a, a receiver. A receiver. The, 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 many of the functions, decision making uh, of, of Harrisburg government will be taken over by a, a receiver who will be appointed. Now, John, the, the functions, as I understand it, are limited to the fiscal recovery of the city. The, yeah, it's, the, it's, it's, it's paying bills, it's pension benefits, it's payroll, it's that kind of the thing. Incinerator the incinerator deal. And yeah, it's selling off city assets like the parking garage, like the incinerator. I mean, the, the city is staggering at under $300 million in debt. It's really a truly yeah. psychotic amount of debt. And it now becomes one of a handful of, of cities in, in, in history to be taken yeah. over by state but, government. But none, do, do any of you know, now I've been saying this, and you'll correct me, I went back and looked, now, I didn't do it, you know, one of those thorough exams that histo political historians are supposed to do. Do either of you know when this has happened before in the history of the state? Other states have done it, right? I mean, there's been, there's been the so-called Act 47 thing where they come in and they set up financial recovery right. plans for troubled cities. But in actual takeover, Harrisburg is something like one of yeah. 40 cities in U.S. history where this has ever happened. Right. Um, there's one in California, I Orange think. Orange County, Orange I County. think, was, yeah, the, was, yeah. the, was the now, other one. Now, this has created, the tension on city council has been palpable where you got Tony, four majority city council people, as you point out, filed for bankruptcy. The mayor is opposed to it. Lawmakers are opposed to it. This thing is now in, what, federal bankruptcy court? This could be, and they're having a hearing, what, in a couple well, of weeks? Well, it's, it's pretty unclear as to how the uh, takeover will affect the bankruptcy because uh, opponents, critics of it, say the bankruptcy move, you know, motion right. is, is flawed on several levels. The right. mayor is opposed to it, as you pointed out. It's also stipulated in state law. It was put right. into state law this summer that, you, that the Harrisburg and other class, third class cities couldn't do this until right. next summer. Those that are in the fiscal recovery plan, I guess, Act 47, go and, ahead. And, and Jeffrey Piccolo, one of the architects Senator of the Piccolo. takeover law, right. uh, has said to me at least that uh, he believes the receiver could simply yeah. withdraw the bankruptcy petition. Now, John, this has become a na you know you've followed this. This is a national story. Well, I mean, folks are weighing in from. Go ahead. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of symbolism here on on, yeah. on so many levels. Good For point. one, it's it's the capital city of Harrisburg, so it's not like it's a. A troubled city like Reading filing for bankruptcy right. and a takeover coming in. And there's 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 a distinct symbolism yep. to the capital city, and it's an, it, frankly, you know, Governor Corbett and others said it's it's an embarrassment to have this city go right. into receivership and bankruptcy. Um, you know, and you've got, frankly, not to put too fine a point on it, a, a group of middle-aged white men on Capitol Hill now moving to take over a majority African American mm -hmm. city. So there's, I mean, there's there's some there's that aspect of there's it There's some too. symbolism of it too. I mean, the, the yeah. nearest parallel I can think of, Terry, and I thought about this a little bit, is Washington D.C. in the mid 1990s, where there was a board of control running the city's finances, yeah. and you had mostly elderly white Southerners overseeing right. the city's affairs. So it's there's there's a lot there's a lot of yeah. symbols and a lot of parallels here. Yeah, I would just I would just point out quickly too that I think it's become national news because of the economic climate. Even though I don't yeah. think that this, this whole issue is necessarily an outgrowth of that. This really has to do with an incinerator project right. and the debt associated. It went awry. With that. They were they made it in, they upgraded the incinerator. 
they were going to make money off of it, then the upgrades didn't go well. Do, do I got that right? Basically, basically the, got, however much trash the incinerator could, took in, it could never keep up with the note. It, yeah, the I financing got it. was so wrong. The, so yeah. the debt is $300 million, and we're going to run to a break. I want to come back and talk about the transport, big, big news on the transportation funding front. But the essence is we got a bankruptcy hearing coming up. Whether the state can file bankruptcy, that's been challenged or the city can file bankruptcy, then we have this takeover law, and within 30 days, if they don't come up with a recovery plan, or agree to a plan, I guess, then, this, then there will be a receiver appointed that will actually handle the fiscal recovery. Is that right? And, yep. and, and, and then we see where that all goes. Yes. All right, when we come back, transportation funding, it's been one of the four big items on the agenda of the legislature. Well, we heard a little bit from the legislature. Will we hear something from Governor Corbett? We'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania Cyber Charter School, bringing educational innovation and freedom to the children of Pennsylvania. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by ReconnectPA.org supporting a comprehensive transportation funding solution and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association business in Pennsylvania is our business hi welcome back well uh, earlier in the summer uh, the governor's transportation commission made a recommendation as I think you know we've done a lot of programming on this the state has something like 1.7 billion dollars a year in transportation needs that would be fix the roads, fix the bridges. Uh, they're in a state of disrepair. John Meisick, big news in the Capitol last week. What happened? Yeah, basically Jake Corman, the Senate Appropriations Chairman, the Republican from Center County, um, in what can only be construed as a move to finally get the administration off the dime on this, came down to the Capitol press room with a bill that would implement a large chunk of the funding recommendations in the governor's transportation report. It's an uncapping of the oil company franchise tax, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically a tax on the wholesale price of right. gasoline. Motorists would be asked to pay more for their registration and their motor dr uh, driving, licenses. driving licenses. But they would have right. to do, they would, the, the upshot of that is the renewal periods would be lengthened. That's what part of okay. the findings. Go ahead. The background on this is that the governor's transportation funding commission released its findings in August was 1st, it in I think August, it was August. Yeah. August yeah. And, 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 and subsequent to that, the governor has signaled that, well, he's looking at other things that beyond the recommendations and that he was going to say something in the fall about what he wanted, whether yeah. it was those recommendations, but here's something else, or a combination. Just you, but just very quickly, he, he indicated, uh, he and his transportation secretary in uh, like September indicated that because of the economy, they're not sure if they're going to come out and, and make a pronouncement about what the governor wants for transportation funding, and hence you have Senator Corman here trying to move things. Okay, but here's, here's, here's the point. I'll ask both of you. John, Yeah. the legislature is not going to vote to increase registration fees, you know, whether it be, you know, uh, license or, or, or the registration fees, you know, up the heat. Do the oil franchise tax unless the governor's on board. Uh, yeah, they don't I mean, want to put votes up, do they? They don't want members to put votes up. No. I mean, uh, John Rafferty, the, the chairman of the Senate, Pro right. Senate Transportation Committee, said last week that he's not doing bubkis until he gets yeah. a clear signal from the administration on what they're going to sign and what they're not. I mean, this is a, a byproduct of, of all of the sort of stress and, and sewers that they went through during the budget season where they got all the stuff queued up, including vouchers, and the governor stepped in and said, yeah, you know, not so much. And so no one wants to do that kind of work. Yeah. Until there's a guarantee that's going to go. Well, and, you agree with that? Well, yeah. And again, what's happening? What Corman said when he announced the, what he was taking the findings and, and putting them in a bill form is, look, I, I want to just put this on the map because it, it, he thought that people were going to come back in the fall and be talking about transportation, and they haven't. Again, largely because the governor has, for the moment at least, not come forward and said what, what he wants, right. and he wants and that, to, he wants to jumpstart the discussion. He wants to jumpstart it, but any way you cut it. We're talking about, and this isn't arguable, I think everybody agrees, $1.7 billion. And, you know, it may, they may not get one point. That was an earlier commission appointed. 2.7. Oh, you think? It, it, it's 2.7 in, sh in, the in the Shoke report. Okay, but, in the early, but earlier yeah, 1. in, a, 7, in yeah. a recommendation that, so, but we're talking about, you, let's say they could even get a billion dollars a year, a, let's say for the next 10 years. In and of itself, that would require the legislature and the governor to agree on raising fees 
and doing something about a tax, whether it be yeah, new absolutely. Home. I mean, there's no other way with the budget, is there? Absolutely. I mean, this is the weird thing. This is everyone agrees it's a problem, and everyone agrees that something has to be done. But it's the getting from the agree, agreeing, you know, acknowledging that it exists to the actual doing of it where the, where the problem is. All right. In a, in a couple of minutes that we have, the legislature has been debating, but they have not done things like a voter ID bill, which would require uh, uh, a, a state identification in order to vote. Now you have to supply identification the first time you vote, but after that you don't have to. And, and uh, regu uh, steeper regulations on abortion clinics. These are not high, you know, not like sell the liquor stores, not like vouchers, but is there any movement, I'll ask you first, Tony, any movement on either of those at the moment? Well, the House, of course, passed the voter ID correct. thing, and it, it, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere in the and Senate, in the at Senate. least for now. On the abortion issue, the House was supposed to take it up this week. Uh, they did not because yeah. we're being told there is some sort of negotiation going on between Republican legislative leaders and the administration for some sort of agreement right. on that. And you agree with that? Any, anything? Uh, is this a question, John Mysick, that... Even though the Republicans have these huge majorities, 112 to 91 in the House, 30 to 20 in the Senate, I think I'm right about that. Mm -hmm. They're not quite on the same page. Is that correct? Is that I, accurate I, I, to say? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the analogy I keep using is that you ever been to Thanksgiving dinner? I mean, uh, you know, you've got people who are all related to each other sitting at the table, and nobody can agree on, <laughs> on anything. Are you Italian? You're not Italian. Um, I, I have, I, I, Tony and I know about I'm those, Italian, right, I'm, I'm Italian on my mother's side. So there that, you that go. Okay. Man, that we'll, we'll, we'll let you at the table. Well, go, go ahead. Go ahead sir. Yeah, no, but so, so the short form is, is that, you know, they're all related, but, you know, families don't agree on everything all the time. You've got this undercurrent of drama as well, that yeah. last week in the pages of the Tribune Review, uh, Mike Terzai, the House Majority Leader, came out and said that Senate President Joe Scarnati is, in effect, a tax and spend liberal who yeah. loves to, you know, oh, loves to make who loves to make deals, who loves to raise taxes, who loves to go into debt, which is like, you know, accusing somebody of being an axe murderer in, in yeah. Republican circles. And, and Senator Scarnati took some umbrage to this and has said, as I understand, that he's not doing anything until Mr. Yeah. Terzai comes over and appropriate so, apologize. So, so you've got this. You've got, got a family about 30 feud. Thirty seconds left. Yeah, I'm just going to say that I think what you're seeing here is, that in a general sense, what you're seeing is that, that the Senate Republican leadership is not as ideological and is more pragmatic yeah, than yeah. the House I think leadership that's is. That's a good point. And as a result, you have these four or five top big issues, but within those top issues, the leadership of each chamber has different priorities. All right, great, great update. All right, health care, an important health care update. we got a couple of important topics to ask one of the experts we call in from time to time to help us understand these matters after we pay some bills. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the State System of Higher Education. 14 state-owned universities, the state system is the largest provider of higher education in Pennsylvania. And by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania. Hi, welcome back for our health care update. Joining me as often is the case is Dr. Stuart Shapiro. He's the president and CEO of the Pennsylvania Health Care Association. He's one of the experts that we call in from time to time. Okay, doctor, look, you wrote an editorial or a, a column, actually an editorial piece in the Allentown Morning Call uh, last month, and you were making some points about these cuts to Medicare and Medicaid and how they interact, particularly on the elderly. So let's sort of go through some of the points that you made in there. And I think you're over, and you tell me if I'm wrong. Your basic point was that there's an interaction between Medicare and Medicaid programs that a lot of people don't understand, that when you start cutting one, it affects the other. Go, go ahead. Am I right about that? You got that right, Terry. Right. In fact, Explain the, the details the, of that. The subject is actually very critical, and it got picked up not just in the Allentown paper, but in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia in the Scranton area and the Bradford area, the entire state's beginning to focus on the interrelationship between Medicare and Medicaid, as you rightly point out. Right, right now, for the elderly who are in nursing homes, for example, about 65% of those individuals are on Medicaid and about 15% on Medicare. 
because the state pays for care for the elderly under Medicaid about $20 less a day than the actual cost, mm -hmm. the nursing homes are bringing in a lot of people for short-term rehab under Medicare. Right. So they've been under-reimbursed under Medicaid and then were able to stay in business stay in, in business. business because of Medicare. Okay. Now, now then, here's ahead. the rub. Under health care reform passed by Obama and the Congress, there were dramatic cuts to Medicare to pay for it. So they, in fact, enacted health care reforms on the back of the elderly and pulled a lot of money out of the system. Then, this, on October 1st, just a couple of weeks ago, Medicare cut payments to nursing homes uh, by about 20 percent across the country. And in Pennsylvania, that pulled $300 million out of the system. And the net effect of this is that it's going to make, and it's starting to make right now, access to nursing home care for the elderly a real problem. And it's a problem because of these dramatic Medicare cuts. All right, let me make sure I understand this. So your point is that because Medicaid payments to nursing homes were under the actual cost, it was being made up in part by Medicare payments for short-term care in nursing homes. And if they cut Medicare, that means that's additional pressure on nursing homes because of the lost revenue. Correct. And, 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 and nursing homes, unlike other health care providers, whether it's uh, hospitals, right. whether it's hospices, whether it's uh, doctors, they are able to, because they have small numbers of Medicaid, mm -hmm deal with this issue. But you have huge numbers. Right. Medicaid. And therefore, we're in a position so now where the elderly are really having Good a point. problem accessing care. Now, in addition to all these cuts, okay. we now have the super committee in Washington and right. the big deficit reduction. And it looks to me like they're playing a game of three-card Monty, like you and I played right. as kids, right. where we would shuffle the deck and we try to move things. But what's happening is they're going to make further cuts in Medicare at the federal level. Right. And even if they do nothing, there's going to be $500 million more pulled out of the system right. by an automatic cut in Pennsylvania. So our, our, Pennsylvania is lucky. Senator Toomey, who's very smart, is mm -hmm. on that committee. Right. But we hope, as he is there, that he will be fighting for the elderly of Pennsylvania right. to make surgical cuts, I just like not the doctor would, but not broad-based cuts. Okay, we're going to run to a break. When we come back, I want, to, I, I want to continue with this, but I want to get into another aspect of this, a change in the, in the uh, uh, affordable health care law that was announced by the Secretary of Health and Human uh, uh, Welfare, HEW, and I want to talk a little bit about that. We'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Highmark Blue Shield, changing the way health plans work for business with a variety of plan options for employers and more choices for employees. Information is available at Highmark.com. Have a greater hand in your company's health. And by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. Hi, welcome back. Well, the host mangled the title of Kathleen Sebelius. It's the Department of Health and Human Services. I threw welfare in there. But uh, er earlier this week, uh, the Obama administration, apparently through the uh, secretary, has given up on the Community Living Assistance Services and Support Program, otherwise known as CLASS. And this is pretty important. It involves long-term insurance. And I want to ask our, our resident expert here, Dr. Shapiro, what, what does this mean? And, and it got some play in the news, and may, Obama may be walking back on that himself. If What's you, this about? Well, Obama realized that part of what the class, at, what the health care reform do, is it created a non-sustainable program. Oh, and that program was the Class Act, the long-term care insurance, because of the way it was structured in that legislation. And he pulled it back, and so mm -hmm. now it's off the table. But that creates a big problem in America. If you ask the average elderly, and you're the expert on polls, who's going to pay for their long-term care needs? And 80% right. of the people are going to need it. They would say the following. Social Security, right. which won't. Medicare, which only pays for short-term rehab. 90 days, is that about right? right? Go ahead. 
uh, they might say Medicaid and Medicaid's going broke mm -hmm. trying to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, or their health insurance, and that won't. So we have a real problem of perception. The Class Act was a tiny baby step, and the way it was structured made absolutely no sense from the beginning. You know, the president was right to pull it back. It was going to cost a lot of money, and it was unsustainable. Mm -hmm. But it does create a problem that America needs to address, and they need to figure out who's going to finance and pay for long-term care. The states have Medicaid. Right. We, in the previous segment, we talked about how it how is unsustainable. Right now, the state of Pennsylvania is providing lots of non-mandated services to the elderly, which are not paid for, which are not necessarily, that don't need to be provided. Give me one, based give me on, one example. Oh, the home and community-based services that are provided in Pennsylvania okay. for the elderly, while very nice, are not required by the federal government. They're usually provide, they're great service. They're usually provided for people who are not very sick. And I think in Pennsylvania what we have to do is prioritize our right. services so, to care for those that are really sick and in need so, of so services. So let me get this straight. You would go through and glean out those services that aren't essential and use that money to pay for the, pro, for the, for the services that are essential. Is that basically Correct, your that point? Correct, that I would make sure that we prioritize the frail, the sick, mm -hmm. the elderly, and I'd make sure that those services are delivered in an efficient way of high quality mm -hmm. and that the Medicaid program reimburses or pays for services by rewarding or it. giving incentives to provide the service okay. efficiently, which it doesn't now. On the other hand, as a national debate, right. we also need to look at this over the long haul and find a system because it's unsustainable right now, All right. and we, maybe we ought to federalize we that. We have about 45 seconds left. Tell me, I mean, is this something that has to be done at the, solely at the national level? You said, is there something, for example, that you would go and sit down with Governor Corbett and say, Governor Corbett, this is what I'd like to do? Oh. The governor now has the authority, with the legislature behind him, obviously, yeah. to fund as a priority elderly services to the sickest okay. and frailest elderly, which they're not doing now. Okay. They're spending a lot of money on people who could have their families and others provide these services. G great, great update. Good explanation. All right. Hey, as always, thanks for watching this edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And, and you always like this. Stay well.